Uh, this week, I was reminded of something that um, m- my brother reminded me, uh, of a story that, that came up when we were kids. Every Thanksgiving, uh, my dad would do this thing where uh, we would sit down, and before we eat, or before we could eat, he would go around the table, maybe y'all do it, and he would say what you were thankful for, right? And when you're, when you're, a, when you're a boy, a man, a, you know, a young boy especially, from like the age 12 to like 25, you are never not hungry. Like, just to be real with you, right, guys? Like, like start about 12, 13. Like, I was always like, people like, you can eat? You want to eat? I can eat, sure. What time is it? Three in the afternoon? Sure. One in the morning? Sure. Like, I can eat. So when you're, when you're like 14, and you've been waiting, and you see all the food, and then your dad's like, let's go around the table and say what we're thankful for. You're like, this is not cool, right? And then when you have a family like mine that was gigantic, like each, each, each of my grandparents' kids decided they needed to fulfill the, the debt of procreating for most of the state of Utah, um, it would really take a long time. So it would get around to me, and they'd say, what are you thankful for, Kyle? And I would always say, I am thankful that this is almost over. <laughs> my dad did not appreciate that. And one year he said, if you say that, I'm going to send you away from the table. He gave me like a week's notice. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do, right? My brothers and my sisters are looking at me like, you got to do it. You got to do it, right? We go around the table, and it gets to me. And I was like, I am thankful for my dad. And he just starts laughing. (laughs) You do, you see those things, and you think, I'm not going to do that when I'm an adult. No way. And then about four years ago, I was reading this passage that we're going to study today. We're just going to kind of do a one-week look at gratitude. And I was reading this passage, and I felt like God said, I want you to tell me what you're thankful for. Like, I'd always heard my dad say that, and, and I was always like, wow, dad. And I was like, why? Why are we going through this, God? And it was in the middle of, so I guess it was three years ago, it was in the middle of the pandemic. And it was in the middle of fixating on what was negative with the world, what was negative with my job, what was negative with everything that was coming against me. And I felt like God was saying, I want you to see this passage, see that it transcends time, and see that I'm inviting you to tell me what you are thankful for. And folks, it sent me on a journey for a bit. Like it was about a month of me going, "Um, God, I'm not going to fake it. You told me I can be angry, right? You told me I can be real. You told me I don't have to be someone who plays a game? He's like, no, read this passage and listen to what it says and respond. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to give some different verses throughout, and then you'll see how it all fits together at the end. But he says this, give thanks in everything. Like, it doesn't leave you any loopholes. I think I've told you before, I went to seminary. Part of the reason I went to seminary was to look for loopholes. I didn't find them. I'm still looking for them. But, like, if you look in the original language, when it's the Greek language it's written in, it says everything. That The Greek word translating for everything unfortunately means everything. Give thanks in everything. And then it says this, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Which is even a bit more tricky. Because um, if you don't know, I know there's always people in here who follow Jesus and people who, who, who don't. Like what we talk about a lot in the church is what is God's will? What does God want for me? What is he inviting me into? We'll talk about it when we meet someone we might marry. Like is it God's will for me to marry that person, you know? Is it God's will for me to take this job? Is it God's will for me to move over here? Is it God's will for me to buy this house? We ask those questions all the time. Do you know what nobody ever says? Do you know what God's will is for you? To give thanks in everything. Because people would go, lame, right? They'd be like, I don't know about that. But that's in the Bible. That's what God is inviting us into. He's saying, what my will is for you is to always be willing to practice thanksgiving. Is to give thanks. Speak thanks. Live thanks. And that's just not something that, you know, our culture does once a year. We give it a little bit of lip service on this last Thursday, right? But he's saying, this is my will for you always. 
give thanks in everything. So I started to wonder, like, why, God, why is it so hard for me? Why even as a kid, when, when so many things were done for me, did I struggle to say thank you? Why even now do I want to tell you all of the negative things? And I started to realize that I do something that I think a lot of us do. I can fixate. I can fixate on that one negative or that second negative, right? It's like when we look in the mirror. We go and get in from the mirror, and we're getting ready to go in the morning, and, and we see everything, and we just kind of make sure it passes check. Um, but what do we do if we're really looking in the mirror? Like most of us, what do we do? We, we, we start to fixate on that thing that we don't like. Like I look in the mirror, right? And I go, no matter how hard I try, it's just not coming. It's not coming back. And then the way it worse was about 11 years ago, we had a child. And that one day I looked in the mirror and I was like, those, those circles under my eyes. Man, why don't they let you sleep? You know? And I can fixate on that. Do you know what I never do? I never look in the mirror and I never go, God, thank you. Thank you for this body that I've got that allows me to do things, like do work for my family. Like I got to carry their luggage all day yesterday. That was fun, you know. Thank you for lips that I can talk and have a conversation with my wife, for arms that I can hug my sons. Like I never say thank you. I never see the total story. I start to fixate on this one thing. Folks, we do that. It's in our flesh. We're, we're amazing. We're professionals. We're all-stars, like upper level at looking at that one thing or that second thing and just obsessing over it. See, it's where our, our flesh leads us. It's also where Satan leads us. And again, if you're new in here and you're new to the church, you're like, okay, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we believe in a spiritual world that absolutely, like, preys on us. Every time you hear that voice whispering in your head, it's not always yours. You're hearing this negative. You're hearing this fixation. You're hearing this focus on everything that's weighing you down. And I believe what God's doing is in this passage, he's inviting us into freedom. To leave that behind. Where he says, give thanks in everything. And this is God's will for you. So how do we do that if we aren't faking it? How do we do that to not just put on a show, but to actually believe it and live it and kind of receive it for us? Because we believe, guys, we go through some gnarly stuff in here. So how can we give thanks in that? Well, what we have to do in that moment in order to really give thanks, what we have to do in that moment is we have to be connected to who really God is and who we are. And what he does and who he says we're all, like what we're all about. What giving thanks really does is connects you and me to our truth story. What do I mean by that? Well, we all have a story with God. We all have a, an individual relationship with him, a unique way that he's wired us and called us. But our truth story is true for all of us. That without him, we have no hope. That's true for every one of us in here. That without him, man, we can't figure it out. We can't chart our own path. We can't figure out the map, put together the right combination. Like even in the most dire situation, that is true about you, that your God sees you and comes after you. That he wants to know you. That he's created you. That he says he knits you together in your mother's womb. That he knows the numbers of the hair on your head. Like I said, not a big deal for me, but for some of you, it's a big deal. <laughs> That's your truth story. All of a sudden, no matter what situation you're in, you realize, oh, God sees me. He wants to know me. He wants to be with me. He doesn't just offer me to be his partner. He says I can be his son. I can be his daughter. And then when I step into that, I'm a part of a family. Like, if you want to know that you're saved, like in your story, God says yes when you say yes to him. If you want to know you're part of a family in your story, God says yes when you say yes to him. 
Like not a family where you have to show out, not a family where you have to look like you have it all together, but a family that knows, man, you walked out of something that was gnarly. A family that knows there's no one better than anybody else. And also your story says that you have a purpose. Every one of us has a purpose. That God created each one of us individually. The Bible says that he created us to do amazing things. Beautiful things. And each one of us, no matter what our circumstances, we can give thanks because that is true. Every day, all the time. See, it helps us to dial back from those things we fixate on. You know this, you know, people who keep a, a gratitude journal, they're 25% happier. I don't know how they quantify happiness in percentages, but this is an interesting study. They say they're about 25% more likely to say they are happy with life than those who don't. This didn't have anything to do with faith. This had people to do with, they took in their journal and they'd take five minutes a day and just write down things that they were grateful for. And most of the researchers who studied it said it, it got them out of their brain of obsessing and fixating and ruminating on those negative things. And for those who know Jesus, what bigger of a blessing it would be to step out of those little things and start to see the big things that are a part of your truth story. So he says, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Jesus, Christ Jesus. Not to force you into anything, but to begin to, to, begin, to begin to free you from those things that bind me and bind you. At the top of the passage, he says this, rejoice always. Again, I hate faking it. So when I see this passage, it's telling me to always give thanks, and then it's like, rejoice always. My mind is like, I don't know if I can do that. But he's saying, no, rejoice always. Like as Christians, I always say this, like we should be able to party better and longer than anyone else. Like we have the greatest joy. We don't have to manufacture it. So even though right now y'all are suppressing it, you can bring it up. I'm just telling you. When it says we can rejoice always. Why? Because our gift in Jesus is secure. Like, nobody can take that from us. The Bible says that salvation belongs to the Lord. So your life in him is secured by him, not by you. You can try, but you can't screw it up. You may think you're strong, but you can't take it from him. Our gift is secure. So this week, I decided to do what my dad did, and I decided to make my kids go around the table. I only have two kids, so it didn't take three hours. And I asked them, what are they grateful for? In the first pass, I didn't give them a heads up, so they're kind of like on the spot a little bit. And I can tell my one son, who's a lot like his daddy, really wanted to say something smart. But then we started to talk about this idea, about who God really is, about who Jesus is. I, I started to share with them that their dad, like, I can get in my head, guys. I can worry so much about what people think of me. I can worry about making the wrong decisions of a, as a leader. And I can start to ruminate on that and just let that take over my life. Thankfully, I've gotten blessed with a great uh, therapist, counselor, who kind of helps me navigate that. And one of the ways that she does is she takes me through this thing where she's like, okay, Kyle, you're, you're obsessing over this relationship with, you know, your, your friend here. And um, you, you think that he doesn't like you and you're going to go through this conflict and it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end poorly. And she always takes me to this like worst case scenario uh, uh, exercise. She's like, let's just say he really hates you. And for someone who, who, who really doesn't like that, you don't even like playing like that, right? Like, let's just say that he really, like, every decision you made has upset him. He's done with you. What's the worst case scenario there? I'd be like, yeah, that he's, uh, he's never going to talk to me again. He's done with me. He thinks I'm the worst pastor, leader, friend there could be. 
She's like, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm like, no, it's not good. I'm just saying, no, that's, she's like, no, you're just, you're going through the, the, the steps. It's like, but what will be true? And I'm like, well, what will be true is I'll be, I'll be sad, like I'll be hurt, like that will not be cool. She's like, yeah, what else will be true? What will be true about your relationship with God? I'm like, oh, yeah, well, he'll still be there for me, right? He'll, he'll still have called you into your church family, right? Right. He still will have given you a purpose and a passion to follow him and know him, right? Right. She's like, so in this moment, like, yes, you can, you can be sad about the broken relationship with your friend, but you can rejoice in something that transcends all of it. I, I do not want you to think I'm asking you today to pretend that our world doesn't throw hard things at you. Personally, culturally, like you open a newspaper, you talk to a friend, right? Like you can get news that is hard, that hurts. And Christians are never asked to just gloss over that. We're also not asked, we're, not, we're also not called to obsess over it. And in a way to think that's the way the world is dictated and ran. So what God invites us to do is to give thanks in everything. He says it's God's will for us. Then he says rejoice always. And then again he says pray constantly. And again, I've told you before, I grew up in the Mormon church. It's very legalistic. It's something where you have to do all these steps, work all the time. So any, ever since I became a Christian, anytime I would hear something like, you must do this. So I hear pray constantly, and my legalistic radar goes off. And I'm like, grace, baby, I don't do anything, right? <laughs> like, grace, like, I don't have to, you don't have to, you can't make me do anything at all. And again, I think it's God asking me to perform. I think it's him asking me to somehow prove myself. But if you put it back in the context of the verse, it's absolutely not. He's saying give thanks in everything. Let it free you from, from that bondage of fixating, of comparing. Rejoice always so you can be connected with the true reality of who God is and who you are. And then pray always. Pray constantly. Why? Because you're in relationship with him. See, as followers of Jesus, we believe we're in a literal relationship with God. Not a token one, not just one, not a metaphorical one, but like a literal relationship with God. And so we pray. That doesn't mean we sound holy. It doesn't mean we sound like a pastor. It doesn't seem mean we sound like somebody that you hear on, a t on TV or something. It just means we talk to God. It doesn't mean we're always on our knees. But we pray with him. We recognize that he's in our day with us. We recognize that he is the one who, who, who fulfills us, who sustains us, who put the breath in our lungs first and put the breath in our lungs that morning. And we realize this relationship can be trusted. Like that it's not going anywhere. That he says, I will never leave you. Wherever you go, I will be with you. And so if the day is good, we pray. If the day is just, huh, huh, we pray. If the day is not so good, we pray. And we know that he is with us always. This is how we live out the truth of our relationship with him. Think about it. Any relationship, it's doing one or two things. It's getting stronger or it's getting weaker. They never just sit in the middle. You may have a friend that you can call up 20 years from now that you haven't talked to, and it feels like you connect right away, but once that initial chat goes away, you realize that you haven't had a relationship over the last 20 years, that it's atrophied in some way, that if you want to rekindle it, you've got to do some work to make it happen. God isn't inviting us to pray, to do some legalistic thing. He wants connection with us, communication with us. One of the things that um, good friends in my life ask me a lot, it's like, how's your marriage? Think about this. If I was like, oh, it's great. Oh, yeah, what's Joy been up to? I don't know. I haven't talked to her in four months. <laughs> right? And you're like, well, Kyle, I think you're misunderstanding what a good relationship is. There's no communication. 
Think about for you, have you ever had a relationship that let you down, like that hurt you? I'm not trying to make you go to a dark space, but just, just really taste the reality of this. See, often in relationships, we say the opposite of a loving relationship is, a, is like a hateful relationship. And I'm not saying hate is good. But when hate is there, there's still like, you're still recognizing that other person. There's still energy being put towards that other person. What feels like the opposite of a loving relationship to me is one where, the, where someone just abandons the other person. Like they just walk away. I don't even care about you anymore. I don't care about you enough to hate you. I don't care enough about you to think about you. Like I'm just done with you. I've had to deal with this. I think many of us, all of us in some level have had to deal with this. I'm not trying to take you deep today into my, uh, into my counseling sessions, but um, what I realized midway through my, my marriage with my wife, like I grew up and when I was nine years old, my parents divorced. And it wasn't necessarily an ugly divorce, but they divorced and just had nothing to do with each other anymore. And I know that's many people in this room. And so I, I, what, I, what I've realized, though, is as a nine-year-old boy, what, what I saw was the closest relationship that I knew, the tightest relationship, it dissolved. And so then when I got married, nine, ten years in, similar time as my parents, I just started to assume, like at some level, subconsciously, this is going to end. The Bible doesn't teach me that. My church didn't teach me that. I, didn't, I would have never even put words to that. But I started to think because of the abandonment that I had saw in my, in my parents' marriage, that that was just going to happen. What God invites us into is a relationship where we see and we're constantly, it's reinforced as he is never going to leave us. He says that time and time again, I will be with you always. So we pray constantly. Not because of some legalistic command or rule. So we can always know, trust, that his relationship will be there. You know what's wild is, is at the same time he invites us to pray all the time. It says that Jesus is praying for us. The Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father and says it intercedes for us, which is a fancy word for he prays for us. And I've told you this before, but I'll say it again. Like, I've often heard that and read that, and I'm up there thinking that Jesus is, like, making excuses for me. Like, there's Kyle. I mean, cut him a break this week, right? Like, he was in a car for seven hours with his kids yesterday. I know he lost it in Victorville, but, but who doesn't, right? He's not saying that. Do you know what he's saying? Like, when we say yes to Jesus... What God saw when he saw Jesus' ministry, when he said, this is my son, I love him, he says that about me now and you now. I know that seems crazy, but that's the scandal of the gospel. Is that Jesus is like, that's your son. He looks at you all, that's your daughter. Like, are you so proud? That is who our God is, and that is his story. There's a, there's a, 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 a quote that always messes with me, even when I, get, when I get in those moments where I'm fixating, or I get in those moments where I'm challenged, or I get in those moments where I'm just um, thinking of the negative all the time. I remember this quote. It says this, If I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Can you just imagine that for a minute? Like if Jesus was in that room and he was just, you could hear him praying for you, no matter what you're up against. Some of you still have family that are here. They haven't left yet. You know you have to go home to them, Right? That's not going to be fun. I'm just kidding. You love it. But, uh, but it is like a lot of obstacles that can come at us. It says, if you could hear Jesus in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. That's who our God is. He says pray all the time so we can absolutely know our relationship with him. He says rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then I, it ends in a way that threw, a, it was like a curve at me at first. But then it says, don't stifle the spirit. Which I just felt like that didn't fit. 
The first time I read it, I was like, I don't don't understand this. Then as I started to study it, I was like, it's the perfect ending. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the Spirit. What you need to know is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is this thing that Jesus says before he dies, he says, I'm going away. He goes, but this thing is coming, it's even better. And if I was the disciples, I'd go like, that makes no sense. I've seen you heal lepers. I've seen you turn water into wine. I've seen you quiet like the religious people who were trying to shut us down all the time. He said, no, something bigger and better is coming. Something unbelievable is coming. He says, it's my spirit. It's going to dwell in you and it is going to change everything. And what I believe God's inviting us into here is he's saying, when we become people, who will rejoice on who God is and what he has done for us. When we are people who pray, who connect with him, who know him, or we are people who realize that we can give thanks in any and all circumstances, we become people who are absolutely tethered and and tied to him. And then when his spirit comes on the scene, we'll follow it anywhere and everywhere. We won't make excuses. We won't say, I can't. We won't say, he wouldn't. We just say, yes, God, where to? Yes, God, let's go. What we find out in that is our guide, our God, he is a world changer. A world changer. Like he does it in the smallest ways. If you follow Jesus for some time, you'll know he'll do it in the smallest ways. He'll prompt you to just be kind to someone, to just maybe bless them in a unique way, to maybe meet them in a certain way. He'll do it in huge ways. He'll call you to move somewhere or or, or make some massive kind of statement with your actions or or your money. But in all of that, what we start to see is that we can really participate with this God who wants to change everything. Redeem and renew everything. And he wants to use us We have an opportunity every Sunday when we come in this room to worship this God. We're going to have a moment in a minute where we can sing, where we can take communion, and we can give thanks to him. I'm never trying to force anyone into into any uh, fake display, but I want to invite every one of you today to truly give thanks to him. If you're a follower of Jesus, to come to this table, to take the bread, to dip it in the cup, and know that that is the most unbelievable gift that could ever be given to you. Your God giving his son. I want to encourage you to be someone who this week doesn't just think about thanks, but practices thanks. I want to give you a tool in the the chair in front of you. You'll see a journal. It's just a small little brown journal. But take it. Take the pen. Um, and, and use it five minutes a day. Just write out things that you're grateful for. Use it to hear God's invitation in this passage. To live your life oriented around his way and not our way. At the same time, grab that invitation that's in front of it. Maybe pray for that person that you can invite next Sunday that you can maybe even share some thankfulness with. Can you imagine that? So many times when we see each other during the week, right? What do we say? How's your week? Oh, I was busy, or this happened, or that happened. Is it rarely ever positive? You should shock someone and be positive. That's what my oldest one does to me every day. I'll come home, how's your day? It was amazing. And I was like, really? He's like, I'm growing buckwheat in the back, and it's sprouting. And I'm like, okay, great. What are we going to use the buckwheat for? I have no idea. But it's growing. Let's be people who trust our Father that way. We've lived this life of fixating and comparing. Let's live this life where he says his will for us is to give thanks in all things. Let's pray. God, you are good. Thanks for challenging me. God, I always tell you I don't want to fake it. But in reality, I think often I do fake it. I focus on the negative, and that's not the true story. 
I, I focus on the issues that are coming at me, God, but that is not the true story. That is the smallest part of the story. God, the great story is that you would bless us, that you would love us, that you would send your son for us, that grace would be what you work with, that mercy would be your gift, that relationship would be absolutely guaranteed, Lord. So we thank you and we praise you, God. We worship you now as we come to the communion table. We worship you now as we sing. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.